Hello, my name is Elizabeth Sumida Waman, and I'm Wanka Ngechua from Central Peru. And I'm also a faculty member at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities in the program of Comparative and International Development Education. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with you about indigenous worldviews and the internationalization of higher education. Internationalization is a set of strategies aimed at increasing prestige, global market competitiveness, and strategic alliances of institutions and individuals. Knowledge acquisition is generally geared toward these purposes, and the notion of intercultural communication and competences have become quite prominent in this dynamic. We also know that internationalization initiatives are not necessarily synonymous with social justice, global equity, or even environmental stewardship. In other words, internationalization as we know it is driven by political and economic agendas and is often constructed as transactional. Indigenous worldviews offer something different to this conversation. For example, the dearly loved Yupiak scholar from Alaska, Angayukak Oscar Kowagli, asserted in 2006 and across his body of works, including his book, Yupiak Worldview, Pathway to Ecology and Spirit, that indigenous worldviews are concerned with knowledge, philosophy, relationships, values, and practices. We're gonna to wanna to think about what these kinds of worldviews signify in a conversation regarding higher education and internationalization work. In order to have these complex discussions, we ought to be aligned on some basic premises regarding why such discussions are even worthy of having. Two areas of alignment that can help us to launch more productive thinking regarding Indigenous peoples and internationalization are the questions of first, who are Indigenous peoples? And by extension, what matters to them? And the question of points of entry for Indigenous peoples to contribute to internationalization theories, research, and practices. The figures vary somewhat on the population of indigenous peoples and their distribution across the globe. However, taking the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, known as the UNPFII, figures and data, estimates will range in the approximately 400 million population range and across 70 to 90 countries. The focus with this kind of data tends to circulate around how to identify indigenous peoples while not defining them. Because this is heavily politically loaded and indigenous communities claim the right to define for themselves their membership and the kinds of affiliations that their members hold. However, the permanent forum offers some factors related to the kinds of people who are claiming indigenous identity. And these include the following. Self-identification, but also being claimed by the people who one is asserting belonging to. Second, continuous link with a pre-colonial or pre-settler society. Third, link to territories and land. Fourth, distinct social, economic, or political systems, essentially, some examples might be your own kind of governance or what any of these terms and structures mean in your particular context. And this is very much tied to the next point. Fifth, distinct languages, cultural practices and beliefs, which contrary to popular and state oppressive ideas does not mean that indigenous peoples need to prove that absolutely all parts of our identities are completely different from those of other indigenous, minoritized, settler, colonial, or dominant societies or peoples. We can, as indigenous scholars, claim and cross streams of knowledges, but that continuous and living connection to pre-colonial ancestry is both important and precious to us. Sixth, 
indigenous peoples tend to form non-dominant groups of society. This can be tricky because there can be countries with large indigenous populations. So it's really key to understand that dominance refers here to the experiences of being minoritized and reduced by inequitable power foundations, epistemically, politically, economically, and socially. And finally, another point of identifier is the resolve to maintain and reproduce ancestral environments and systems as distinctive peoples and communities. This is central to indigeneity, meaning the ways in which indigenous people see ourselves in relation to the things that make us indigenous. And it's also linked with the self-identification piece. We have to hold purpose and it is an articulated purpose that makes claims of indigeneity more than just about individual identity. In fact, any focus solely on individual identity is, I would argue, a problematic distraction from what is happening to our indigenous world views and the world around us. Currently, indigenous peoples are not the dominant contributors to internationalization discourse, theories, research, goals, and practices. I would also add that this is probably true of actively minoritized peoples around the world. Internationalization tends to include government, institutional, and individual goals. And in higher education, its initiatives are connected to the status of institution, which is also played out in world institutional rankings. For example, more elite higher education institutions can claim a kind of cosmopolitanism of their faculty and students who have been able to achieve this mindset through the availability and access to international, internationalization opportunities. So where do indigenous peoples fall in this schematic? We're largely not the progenitors of conventional internationalization but are rather the targeted participants in some form. For example, through being asked to send more American Indian students into study abroad programs in order to help the institution reach its diversity and inclusion goals for those kinds of programs, which are largely populated by white students, and with the claim that these students will also benefit from such experiences. In other words, a type of a win-win situation or indigenous peoples are asked to receive as hosts people from elsewhere who are interested in indigenous cultures. In this particular graphic, I separate out indigenous destinations and cultures as whole entities and as places from the idea of indigenous peoples as two-way participants. And this is because the idea of place and culture within the colonial and contemporary imaginary is important to discern because too often the idea of the there does not get to determine how those who are there are read by the here. And the here is also too often European rationalization and sense-making of the quote unquote rest of the world. In other words, internationalization initiatives that include travel may be focused on ideas of places and cultures that actually start off as tropes in conventional internationalization. Whether or not they stay that way depends on a lot of things, including quality of relationship and long-term commitments. So where are there misalignments with internationalization and indigenous communities? First, the idea that we are not inherently global citizens and that higher education serves a purpose in developing global citizens really needs to be unpacked. Kikuyu scholar Ngugi Watiango talks about the arbitrary assignment of the terms local and global. What is local and what is global? What is the here and the there and who decides? This is what I am jokingly referring to as the tomato-tomato debate. In this case, who gets to declare something 
The circumstances around the condition of something being local or global or international must be looked at in relation to colonization and white and Christian supremacy. That is, what constitutes legitimate or useful international engagement with the world? This question also leads to the second point, which is that conventional ideas of internationalization require acceptance and complicity with what is considered national and thus international. Stakeholders of internationalization may understand that there are indigenous peoples and communities, but they may not understand indigenous autonomy, sovereignty, or self-determination movements and assertions that include indigenous language rights, governance system reestablishments and creation, and perhaps most importantly, the relationships with places that indigenous peoples have stewarded for millennia and the geopolitical tensions that these assertions create because indigenous interests are not necessarily aligned with and can be in conflict with state agendas. The question here is then, where is the space for conceptualizations of indigenous nationhood in the internationalization configuration? Is the internationalization configuration iterative and malleable or is it rigid? And if so, why? This leads to the third point in the problem of fit between indigenous peoples and internationalization, which is that indigenous forays and new pathways at all levels of education from early childhood to tertiary structures must and already are in many places reflect broader struggles, realities and aspirations for indigenous self-determination. This means that we understand that we live in a system of coloniality with defined domains of struggle for power. And this comes from Latin American literature largely, the structure of coloniality as being defined by four domains, interlocking domains of land, labor, economy, and then secondly, institutions of authority like military policing and courts, third normativity like gender, sexuality, religion, and family, and fourth knowledge and subjectivity. Indigenous peoples are doing a tremendous amount of work worldwide to address these domains, interrogate them, and then refuse practices of any kind that move us away from what sustains us, such as connections to places, languages, and cultural practices that demonstrate an ethic of empathy and care I'm not sure that internationalization in its conventional approach does this. Thus the idea of Mohawk scholar Audra Simpson's notion of refusal is important here. How do indigenous peoples and communities refuse the nation states within which they are contained? And if internationalization stakeholders are interested in examining this refusal, then they need to understand who they work for and how those investments made in that work either support or contradict indigenous self-determining futurities. That is our abilities to determine how to structure and go about our lives in conscientious ways. A practical lens from which to look at internationalization with regards to indigenous stu students in higher education is accessibility which is that in different places, including the US and in parts of Latin America and the Pacific, the numbers of indigenous students achieving in higher education and the numbers of indigenous faculty within those structures of higher education is quite low. This statistic is attributable to a starkly oppressive colonial history which communities are still awakening from after two, three, four, five centuries or even less based on contemporary histories. Indigenous historians have researched and written extensively on how educational structures were designed to assimilate and often in terrifying ways 
These cases are still making headlines in countries like Canada with its Indian residential school history. Muscogee Creek scholar Shanina Lomawaima has described the transition of life from indigenous communities where children were removed to the entrance of these schools as being marched, marked by an arch. Indigenous peoples have to think about the metaphor of that arch today, meaning what marks the passage from one kind of life to another? And where are these arches? And in higher education, a promising question for internationalization could be how that arch can be dismantled or repurposed. Lastly, given this kind of tough history of indigenous peoples in education, proponents of internationalization in higher education also have to think about each initiative that is taken by the institution as moving beyond the language of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Access to mainstream higher education and internationalization opportunities cannot be about helping dominant institutions to remake themselves in a more progressive DEI light, but must be outright acknowledging of the lands upon which those universities sit and must be corrective and furthermore healing. Indigenous peoples are not ingredients for someone else's diversity stew. Their claims to sovereignty, self-determination, and autonomy challenge states to rethink what citizenship is based on and also at once its complicated history, benefits, and damages. At the heart of these kinds of histories and challenges for education is a very clear purpose-driven question. Education for what or toward what? And internationalization in higher education is no exception. In my work with the 37 tribal colleges and universities in the United States, and in partnership with the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, we have called for an indigenous centered internationalization, and maybe it's called something else. We are proponents of education as interwoven with environment, health, spirituality, language, and all other elements that create the possibility and conditions for peoples to realize self-determination. If education is part of an array of tools for indigenous self-determination, then internationalization must also be. But internationalization is not always at odds with indigenous interests. Indigenous peoples also take up conventional methods of internationalization that are linked with status purposes, although in kind of different ways. President Russell of Diné College in Arizona, which is the oldest tribal college in the US, referred to his college's founding principles and made the following statements. One, for any community or society to grow and prosper, it must have its own means for educating its citizens. And it is essential that these educational systems be directed and controlled by the society it is intended to serve. Second, if a community or society is to continue to grow and prosper, each member of that society must be provided with an opportunity to acquire a positive self-image and a clear sense of identity. This can be achieved only when the individual's capacities are developed and used to the fullest possible extent. It is absolutely necessary for every individual to respect and understand his culture and heritage, and he must have faith in the future of his society. Third, members of different cultures must develop their abilities to operate effectively, not only in their immediate societies, but also in the complexities of varied cultures that make up the larger society of humans. So we can see that there are clear openings for exchange and knowledge cross flows with tribal colleges, but what makes them and their understanding of internationalization or global education distinct is the why. Why engage with others? Why consider the whole planet in the educational core for indigenous students? These pursuits, we argue, are linked with the idea of sustainable self-determination, 
which has been extensively described by Selahi scholar, Jeff Korntassel. He writes, sustainable self-determination as a process is premised on the notion that evolving indigenous livelihoods, food security, community governance, relationships to homelands and the natural world and ceremonial life can be practiced today locally and regionally, thus enabling the transmission of these traditions and practices to future generations. Operating at multiple levels, sustainable self-determination seeks to regenerate the implementation of indigenous natural laws on indigenous homelands and expand the scope of an indigenous self-determination process. As indigenous tribal college faculty members will point out, the learning of indigenous students is focused on the relationships and processes that we are bound up in that make us who we are. So what does any of this mean for internationalization at mainstream institutions? It is possible that it doesn't mean anything because sometimes things are very hard to move at mainstream institutions. But this does mean a lot for indigenous serving and tribal schools. The UPX scholar Angayukak provides us with an idea of what it means to serve indigenous knowledge interests, as does Jeff Korntassel. And perhaps this is where internationalization can broaden its scope to think about indigenous communities and territories as epistemic and vital nations. What does it mean to support these interests as part of internationalization strategies and an agenda and across early childhood through tertiary and adult education? Furthermore, it is not ethical or possible to discuss internationalization and indigenous education or indigenous higher education without introducing indigenous languages. While internationalization strategies can include language learning and quote unquote foreign language emphases, they do not require it. Moreover, foreign language designations speak to whoever is historically in power. For example, for tribal colleges and universities in the US that are reclaiming that power, English is the foreign language. Internationalization efforts need to recognize the centrality of indigenous languages to indigenous epistemic nationhood. To us as indigenous peoples, our languages are the original languages. English is a feral global language, a conglomeration of multiple roots, making etymology and evolution of terms quite interesting. But indigenous languages, with the caveat that they too are evolving, are original languages from original communities and groups. These languages do not have feral etymologies. Rather than being spread out, they're actually deeply rooted to places and what is learned across places, including philosophy and spirituality. However, this existence through language, with language, is heavily threatened. And I could argue that the ways in which internationalization programs make language teaching decisions anywhere is actually inherently politicized and can exacerbate or create tensions that indigenous peoples are left to grapple with. One of the biggest things that indigenous peoples and communities challenge proponents of internationalization to consider is the question of whose agenda matters most in the opportunities that are built and the transactions that are involved. Indigenous research, such as the work that the tribal colleges and universities are doing worldwide in the US, Canada, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Latin America and elsewhere, challenge the discourses of internationalization and its very frame. 
because we are in what Aymara scholar Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui has referred to as a crisis of words. In other words, internationalization as reflective of a crisis of words, programs, and ideas that have already been co-opted by states. Indigenous education and indigenous educators reframe internationalization and they ask us to transcend the language of what is national and international, to think about relationships across worldviews. And isn't that wonderful and good that there are many voices that would pause and ask us to think about what we are doing and putting out into the world. Thank you.